Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's get going. Thanks, I'm guys. I'm super excited that we're all uh, here and that we get to do this. I've um, this the from like episode two that I started the podcast. I was like, this is something we have to do. So, uh, and I was really. I'm really pumped about it. So let's, uh, what I want to do is um, we're having, this is the first ever kind of mini conference that I'm putting on. And I want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to introduce themselves. One, so that those listening to this will know everybody's voice. Uh, and two, so that um, uh, those, uh, uh, so that we can all just know who's here. Um, if you can't see it, I'm sorry. I'm just going to babble because I'm super excited. Uh, okay, so I'm Jeff. Uh, <laughs> I'm the I'm the dialogue, the dialogue doctor, uh, and um, I write uh, supernatural thrillers, um, and my pronouns are he him. Uh, yeah, Laura, why don't you give us a quick introduction to who you are? So um, I'm Laura Hum. I use she her pronouns. Uh, Jeff allows me to provide the. he finds helpful. Not really sure why. <laughs> so I'm super pumped to be here. Awesome. Uh, JP, you're the next in my little roundabout. Good. Uh, I'm JP Reinflush. I'm co-host on the Right Away podcast. Um, and I use he, him pronouns for now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Fantastic. Uh, JP, what do you write? Um, right now working on urban fantasy series. Awesome. Uh, all right, Chris. I'm always so slow on the unmute button. Um, I'm Chris Kane, co-host of the Right Away podcast. I write all over the place, uh, but under a super secret pen name, I ha um, write romance, and that's what lets me be awesome full time. And I use she, her pronouns. Awesome. Uh, Mark? Uh, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I mostly write under Mark Leslie for obvious reasons. Um, I go by uh, he, him. I'll go by they, them as well. I write urban fantasy, horror, paranormal, uh, speculative fiction in general. Awesome. Uh, all right, let me introduce our two uh, guests that um, are giving us time today. I'm and pausing, Karen, again, thank you. So Karen and I have been friends now for five years four or five years um we karen was coaching basketball and uh i watched them coach basketball and decided that they were an awesome person that i needed to have in my life so uh they graced me with their friendship and i have learned so much by being their friend um it's really been a somewhat of a life for this uh ex-southern baptist uh ex-evangelical pastor it's been somewhat of a uh a uh a, a, a massive milestone step on my journey. So uh, I will ever be grateful and I'm excited that uh, I get to share Karen uh, and uh, their partner with the world a little bit. Their partner is Paz Galupo. Um, Paz is uh, a professor of psychology at Towson University. Oh, I should also say, Karen's a phenomenal writer that works with Laura and I at Submersion. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so excited about our friendship. I forget all of your accolades. Um, Karen is a fantastic writer that works with Laura and I at Submersion. Uh, yeah. So Paz is a professor of psychology at Towson who specializes in sexual orientation and gender diversity. Um, and uh, are you still the editor for the Journal of Bisexuality? Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there's more accolades that you have that I am not listing. Uh, so I'm super excited for y'all to come and just talk to us about, uh, to take us on a little bit of a journey about understanding gender identity, uh, to open our eyes and um, help us see through the lens of others a little bit. Uh, and part of the reason I, I really wanted to do this as writers is because I believe as writers, it is our mission to um, understand and have empathy for others so that we might bring uh, the stories of other people into the world. So with that uh, brief introduction, pause and Karen, I'm gonna let y'all take it away. Okay. I'm gonna make you figure out how to make sure that. <laughs> I'll also say that, that I'm really excited to have this conversation with people who are writers. And even though I don't write fiction um, much, um, really what I do write 
scientific articles specifically about gender. And my research really focuses on trying to collect really their stories and their and the ways in which they experience the world and trying to do right by them by taking their stories, trying to understand them, put it in scientific terminology so that most of psychology and most of the medical science who um, don't think about trans and non-binary and queer identities in general, um, so that we're able to kind of center our understanding on that lived experience. And so for me, what's really important about writing in any way is finding a way to really just capture um, the stories and the lived experience in a way that really honors people. Um, so it's really exciting in some ways because it, it feels like I do a very different type of writing, but I think it's the same. I think the, the point is to communicate, to kind of live in that experience, to be able to perspective take and to humanize, right? And um, to humanize experience in one way or another. And so um, I'm just kind of in awe of what you do as writers. And I'm hoping that this is a framework. Um, we tend to do these um, trainings in some ways. To, often we're asked to come in and talk about gender and sexual orientation in a way that helps people understand the community. But one of the things that I really try to emphasize is the fact that by thinking about gender diversity and thinking about the framework that we're gonna kind of show in terms of thinking about gender mapping, it really is a way for us all to think about our own gender, um, regardless of where kind of you position yourself. Um, everybody has a gender, everybody has a, an experience. And um, part of being able to tap into, I think, anybody else's experience is also to know your experience well. And so I'm hoping that when we go through this, not only will you think about it as, oh, how could I maybe write about queer characters or trans characters, but like also really use it as a way to think about how we can diversify it and complex, uh, make uh, salient, I think, the complexity of everybody in one way or another. Um, and, yeah, and I think for us, um, I'll, Jeff, Jeff, if you could share um, the screen or so I could share the PowerPoint. I think I don't have uh, privileges to do that. Yeah, but so sorry. While we're doing that, I just wanted to add I'm that- I'm keeping all of my privileges to myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that, is the, the one thing that when we talk about uh, gender is that it's such an individual experience, but we live in a society. So we don't get to always negotiate. We, we have to negotiate that uh, in relationships and in relation to others. And that often can change and add different dimensions. Um, we're often asking uh, individuals, uh, well, individuals, we look at it as um, a responsibility or a luxury maybe that some don't have to interrogate their gender. But in actuality, there's a richness and there's an empowerment in spending that time and having that conversation and being intentional about it. And so I feel like when I'm writing, there's a pressure to tell a story. And I have to remember that it is, that if I'm intentional about that story, it adds more clarity to like, why, why do I need this character in the world? And I think that sometimes we do it because we think that we're, we need to honor the diversity in the world and we wanna represent the diversity and sometimes um, people when writing, I'm sure do it because it, it might open up to a whole new set of people who might read or purchase your things. And so, right, like, so if we're intentional about that character or the intention that we're writing it, it doesn't muddle it necessarily where all of a sudden it gets uh, into a one dimensional um, piece that, um, so I think the conversation today will help frame some of that in how to add some richness and, mm -hmm. and variety. Um, and so I think, yeah. let's pull that up first. Right. So this is the time where we all have to start talking about <laughs> what we're doing. So this is where, where it's not showing. I think up. you have to take that off first because it wasn't up before, so it's not giving you the option. No. Did I share it appropriately? I may not have. No, we just, once we get it, then we won't have to do it again, which will be really good. There we go. Yeah. All right. And then just make it so that you can see the whole slide. 
I don't know what the slideshow. There we go. Okay, that was, we don't need that. We already, we already covered all of that. <laughs> all right, so, but we did wanna, and I think you were already speaking to some of this, but when we're, what the model that we're gonna show, we normally talk about is kind of mapping gender. Um, and one of the things that it really emphasizes that is that gender is multidimensional. It's complex and it's experienced in a social context. And one of the reasons I almost always, when I do this, even when I'm in class, I always try to borrow Karen and have Karen come to class with me because when we're talking about it, even my own experience of gender is something that I experience really differently when I experience it in the context of my family, when we're I, people read me differently if I'm by myself versus when we're together versus when we're with our kids versus all of those pieces. And so I think one of the things about gender is it's so absolutely personal and it's an, a personal identity but it's socially communicated and it's socially interpreted. And so my experience of gender also really shifts depending on the conversation I'm having. The language I use about gender is gonna depend upon um, the degree of safety that we feel, the degree of um, understanding. Um, and so we might have these very personal identities and labels that really work for ourselves but might not be understood or communicated socially. And so one of the things that always happens um, when you have queer identities or non-normative identities in general is that you often have to code switch, right? You often have to shift how you're presenting yourself, making yourself palatable, making yourself feel more safe. And so your language is something that really shifts or it might not always be about safety. It just might be about what's understood. So. I'll talk about, we'll talk through kind of our identities, but at times I might use, I might label my sexual orientation bisexual. And that's a term that's probably more understood. Um, if I were labeling it myself, I might say queer, or I might say pansexual, but I might choose to use bisexual depending on who I'm talking about, because I might not wanna talk for 20 minutes and explain what pansexual means, right? And so the language we kind of, constantly have to shift and adapt our language in a particular way. And that happens a lot in the queer community. A lot of times people are like, ah, oh, there's so many labels and, and why can't you all just use the same words? And why can't you all? And it's really because having a non-normative identity, the onerous becomes on us to have to find a way to communicate to other people in a way that they understand that the way that they're, it's gonna be palatable to them in that particular situation. And so it's not that we don't know ourselves, right? It's that, we, it's, it's that we're so misunderstood in society that we have to constantly code switch in order to um, communicate for other people's comfort often. And so, so awesome. that's that social kind of piece to it that I think matters. What were you going to say, Jeff? So if I can jump in real quick, just for, sure. because I know that there are people out there that are like mm -hmm. me, that like the idea of gender being beyond male and female is mm -hmm. um, like speaking French to yep. them. Um, so I just want to like, one, I think what you said is, is really important and profound. So I want to just kind of rephrase it for a second and then ask you to explain a little bit of it. Uh, ask you to explain some of it a little bit more. So to summarize what I heard you saying, um, gender is a very personal thing mm -hmm. that you internally know who you are uh, in gender, or at least are on a journey of discovery for who you are as, as your gender. Mm -hmm. um, but then gender is also something that's interpreted by people outside of you that are looking in and has this social context so that um, the expression of your gender uh, also has this play in mm -hmm. the world around you and how people treat you. And you were using the word code switch. Would mm -hmm. you mind going into just a little bit more about what you mean about code switching? Yeah, it just means that the way that I have to express or think about my identities, I'm a, I really have to think about that. I have to think about how I'm presenting myself or the words that I'm using, or the ways in which I'm being read in terms of my gender, sexuality, or even race. Um, so being a non-Black person of color for me is something that 
you know, I have to decide when I want that to be more salient in a conversation versus not. And sometimes I have control of that and sometimes I don't. So I will say that like often, um, often I have to kind of, I'm more, I'm more often in a situation than Karen where I have to come out to other people about my sexual orientation because it might not be something that is as readily read about me. So our experience as queer people are actually really different because when Karen, when people encounter Karen, they're more likely to, to read them as queer. So it's not something that Karen necessarily has the ability to shift or, but I can, I can decide to come out or not and sometimes it's a protective way or because it's salient or it's not salient. So sometimes maybe I want, it's important for my queerness to kind of be part of what is being negotiated in that immediate moment. And sometimes it's not. Um, when you have a normative identity, often, and, and often you have to do that, you, often you have to code switch like that when you have non-normative identities, when you're likely to be discriminated against because of them or thought about differently or devalued because of them. But when you have mostly normative identities, you kind of just show up in the world and you expect that people are gonna respond to you in a particular way. Um, and that's a privilege that when you have, so white people don't tend to come into conversations and think about, oh, how is my whiteness being read right now, right? But I often, people make it very clear to me. I know when somebody re reads me as somebody who's a person of color or thinks that that's salient or when, you know, I often get the, because I'm ambiguous racially to some people that it, for a lot of white people, I'm kind of palatable enough, right? And so in that way, they kind of let that slide and they don't make uh, me being a person of color kind of something that's salient in that situation. I can call attention to it. I can out myself in terms of a lot of my identities because I have a lot of ambiguous kind of identities um, or borderland kinds of identities where they're not necessarily known to other people. So for example, um, you know, the fact that I'm not very often read as being Jewish. I'm like the most unsuspecting Filipino Jew there is, right? Like I don't fit that stereotype. So what that means though, is sometimes that people don't, my, my Jewishness, right, isn't out there, which means I hear a lot of like anti-Semitic shit. I, I hear kind of what that is and I can decide to put that out there. And if I do out myself as being Jewish, then I also notice how differently people kind of respond to me. And so code switching is this idea that you can, you can make salient in some ways. It, and I make it sound like it's a strategy. It is a, a safety strategy, but it's also a burden to have to constantly think about how you're bringing your identities in and out of conversations because what happens is most people assume normative identities. You're in, most people are gonna assume you're straight, assume you're kind of white, assume that you are uh, cisgender and only if they find a cue that feels out of place to them, are they going to, maybe you look whatever people think, you know, a trans or a non-binary person should look like, or maybe you look queer somehow, and then that becomes salient in a particular way, but you're kind of normative and less proven otherwise. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate yeah. you explaining that. I know um, as a, uh, you know, white, Christian male straight who grew up in the South code switching is never something I've ever had to even consider right like yeah JP you had um dropped something in the chat um I'd love for you to share if you're willing yeah yeah um so I'm a white guy which is pretty obvious but uh I'm from the Midwest I'm also a queer man uh and I work in like the manufacturing world uh outside of writing often I have to use they pronouns for my partner um, just because out of safety, um, especially in the Midwest when gay marriage was a, a stronger conversation, I constantly would say, use the they pronouns just to kind of identify who my partner was because I just didn't feel comfortable ever saying he to a lot of people I worked with. So it took a long time for me to start saying he, him and, and kind of acknowledging that, but yeah. 
Can I ask a question that's sort of related to that? Um, yes. I, I'm, I'm curious about non-normative and normative, and, and, and I haven't really used or heard those terms um, mm -hmm. much. So I appreciate getting those because it actually brings a different context that kind of makes a higher, higher level hierarchy mm -hmm. because it can apply to so many different yeah. variances as the middle-aged privileged white guy, right? Uh, the straight middle-aged <laughs> white guy. So I have all of these, all of these, I guess, perks or pros that have come by default. But um, uh, my partner Liz and I constantly try to use um, uh, ambiguous um, uh, ways to talk about one another. And even after we're married, we're probably going to continue to use the term partner because I think, and maybe I'm wrong, if I use it more often, if in social contexts I identify the pronouns that I identify with, uh, even if they're you know normative, mm -hmm. um, that that actually makes it less non-normative for people who are backed into a corner or don't have the luxury or the choice. Does that maybe? Does that maybe? Um, does that actually help? It does actually. I mean, I think it it um, it creates it it creates it takes away that assumption, right? So um, if you're if you're being ambiguous, and even like APA, so I'm a psychologist, so the American Psychological Society now or Association now says use they them, use it as a singular pronoun. You can use it because you're honoring that that's somebody's pronoun, but you can also use it to refer to people when gender just isn't salient, right? Um, and when you do that, and, and when you don't gender everything, there's so much about our language that's gendered, right? But if in situations you're not, you're not gendering it, then you're not making these heteronormative or cis-normative kinds of assumptions that are out there that then force people to have to insert their, the ways in which they're non-normative, then it's just kind of understood that, you know what, everybody, you know, people might have partners and they might not always have to identify their gender. So it, if you do that, then it doesn't seem so odd when somebody is code switching and being like, oh, my partner and they are this, it doesn't feel like you're necessarily hiding something because we're, we're all not showing up being gendered all of the time. Um, Thank yeah, you. and I think code switching also has um, a way to re retain power, but it also, for the individual, but it also, um, it, it also creates distance. So there's only so much that someone is authentically willing to bring to the table. Like at JP in the example you're giving, right? Mm -hmm. There's only so many people that are gonna be able to be entered into your personal life because we're not making space. And we're asking someone with a non-normative identity to come in with their elbows out and make space for themselves. And that's not always easy or comfortable. And so then we're not inviting people in. So by, by doing that, you're saying, here's the space, take it if you want it, rather than saying, you know, create your own space in an environment where you're not really sure, um, you know, how, how to do that, or if it's worth it, or if it's safe, or whatever those things are. So I think I think there's that idea of the language in code switching and why it happens. It's not always the same reason, but mm -hmm. but we're also missing, um, you know, the richness of people um, because we're asking them to shelf a part of themselves. And just to clarify what you said about uh, Karen, I I think what you said just there is so important that I want to stay on it for a second. When you're code switching. Um, what I hear you saying is that you're making a choice between do I reveal who I really am and share myself with the world uh, and risk being discriminated against, risk being treated differently in that idea of like um, risk losing power in a relationship was how you phrased it, or do I retain power in the relationship, which is what I wanted to dwell on, because I don't think for normative people like me, we don't think in terms of power because we always have it. Mm -hmm. So we don't like think about the idea that somebody might discriminate against us based on us being different because, you know, we are the majority. So there's this idea of like um, the what you have to consider that, you know, personally, I've never had to consider, which is the definition of privilege, is that you have to consider whether or not um, you're going to give someone the power to discriminate against you as you reveal who you are. 
Am I, am I summarizing that? Uh, yeah, and to really know the implications of it, right? So if I say it in this one context, how do I know it's not going to come up in, in at work or in these other environments that could lose or in a setting where I could be evicted from where I live? You know, we don't have all the protections all the time in every single situation, in every single uh, job or every single housing. So, I mean, I think when you do that, you, you're not just taking the risk and saying like, do I do, what will I get out of this? You're saying like, is, what's the risk ratio reward for me? Um, and often that, that you're, you're, you're taking that risk of saying, um, I will accept some social isolation in, to secure housing, employment, and things like that. And I think that we, we don't always talk about that because we're, we're in a world in which we feel like it's getting better, right? And so in certain contexts, sure, there it is. And, and there, are, there are things that are progressing and there are, um, and it's conversations like this and it's, mm -hmm. and it's breaking down the idea that there's, um, there's some, you know, I think in any community or culture, um, I'm always, you know, I know Paul shared earlier that we're Jewish. And so I, I grew up hearing a lot of Yiddish. And so I say things at times people look at me like, Ever, nobody knows what you're talking about right here. But to me, I think it's common knowledge. I think that there are words that in, in uh, that I can't figure out a way to capture it in English. Sometimes it's like a, just a, a sentiment that just, and then, and everyone's like, I, I'm, I'm kind of in context trying to understand what you mean. So I think we also know that language itself within community and across communities needs to, needs to evolve and, and, and be shared. So, so there is a, a mutual understanding, a, an operational definition, if you will, of what the words that we are saying um, and, and how does it, what does it mean to, within community or to somebody who identifies and how is someone else perceiving that word because um we also create a culture where um there are people who do not care but the people who do care care so much that it also stops communication because they don't want to offend because they don't want to hurt and so then it leaves um it leaves this this little bubble where you're um you have to figure out a way to cross that and have conversations so we can all learn from each other. Yeah, I think the one thing too, the flip side to thinking about the discrimination and the safety, which is always an issue. But I think the other thing that I, that, that I, I also wanna think about the flip side is, yes, you might not, you might decide not to bring your full self because of safety issues. But the other piece to it is, is think about what happens when you can bring your full self, right? Think about how much that space has changed. How much, like for me, it feels like relief when I can talk about all of my identities or for when I'm not thinking about that. And I'm showing up in that space very, very differently than if I'm sitting there cognitively spending my time trying to assess my safety. And so, yeah, we wanna make it so that um, so that people feel safe. But we also think about like, how much is, would our space be changed if we all just brought ourselves and our complexity there? And I think that this happens with cis straight people as well, is when we start thinking about gender, we have such strict ways of thinking about what's appropriate that these ways of um, in some ways, policing our own gender is something that, that, that cisgender people do too. It's something that straight people do too, because there is a, and often cis straight people do this um, in a way because it kind of stick to gender roles, because if they don't, then they're perceived as being non-normative, then they're perceived as being gay, or they're perceived as being non, uh, you know, non-binary or gender non-conforming in one way or another. Um, and so that fear of that, regardless of your identity, is something that keeps us in these really strict and narrow places where we're, none of us are really bringing our full selves um, to it. And so that gender binary, which is kind of the basis of 
of what we're thinking of, of what we'll kind of talk about, I think is, is something that's really important. What I love about this conversation is I kind of had on this third point, this idea of positionality. And I think our conversation brought us there, right? Like this idea of what are our, all of our different social identities? Um, how, do we, how do we position ourselves? Do we know ourselves and, and all of our different aspects and how can we kind of locate our gender in that way? For me, for everybody, I think that gender is something that is, um, is racialized as well. I think I'm more aware of it being um, a person of color, but I think that even that our ideas about gender are, are intricately tied to our, our ideas of whiteness as well. And so in order to fully understand gender, you also have to kind of fully contextualize that and understand how you're positioned in terms of your race um, and, and in terms of your other social locations like sexuality and social economic status and all of those things. So even as we're talking about gender, it gets positioned, I think, in some of those other ways. Um, Pause, Bef before you go sure. on for a second there, um, I love what you're, what you're saying about positionality and I know you're gonna get back to this, but right before you started talking about positionality, um, you said something that I think is, is really important um, and I know you're gonna highlight it later, um, but for those who are listening who um, maybe it, it kind of slipped by. Um, you mentioned that oftentimes um, people with normative identities police their own gender because they're afraid that if they move outside of the very binary gender, um, that they're going to be seen as something they're not. But what I noticed that you said was that you didn't say that they would be seen differently as like, male or female or masculine, but it that they would be seen as gay or queer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's really important. And again, I know that you're gonna to touch on this, but um, just kind of as a preview, as we're like thinking about positionality, and as we're thinking about how we negotiate our own genders, um, just this idea that we need to make sure that we're not conflating or making all of these things one. And you mm -hmm. said it at the very beginning when you started that gender is really multi-dimensional. And I think, what you just said was so like so easily slips under the radar because we do have this idea that someone who um is um has a male sex assigned at birth who tends to act more effeminate is automatically assumed to also be gay mm -hmm. um and i think that one of the things that um all of the training and all the times that I've worked with you and with um, Karen, like that was the big thing for me that was just like, wait, these things are discrete. We need to stop applying one to the other. So um, I know you're going to get to it, but just because you had said it as, and I feel like it kind of ties in with that positionality as well. So anyway, thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, I love that you brought that up and I, I'll come back to that too. I think when we talk a little bit about alignment normativity and our assumption that if you know your where you're positioned on one aspect of gender and sex, that then then we know what um, we think is is should be happening or or where our assumptions go for for one of the other dimensions. But I think yeah, absolutely, sexual sexuality and that gender is something that's very discreet, and that's something that we'll kind of see on this map as well. I think we might have, I think maybe go, no, no, there you go. So here's the difference. So we talked about gender as being something that is multidimensional. And so what we have on here is kind of a gender, uh, a map or a way of like pulling out different aspects of thinking about gender. This is intentionally written in a way that you kind of see the binary that's there because that's our cultural assumption. We think of gender in very binary ways. We think of if you're looking at this side, we're seeing kind of what we expect for male experience. On this side, we see what we would expect for kind of um, experience of women, right? And what we tend to think about when we think about any of these dimensions is that our cultural conceptualization is that gender is binary, which means that there are two, um, two possibilities that are the natural possibilities, that are the ones that are 
um, that we're going to assume when it when we think of something as being binary and and those are kind of the normative experiences the normative experiences are the ones that also go on unexplored right we don't have to explain we don't ask people who are cisgender why do you identify as a man tell me how you got that way right we don't we don't devise entire psychological theories to try to describe why that happens right it, but it's the middle points Right when when we see human variation, which is very natural, that doesn't fall along these binary kinds of expectations. That that's where we center trying to explain, and that's and people whose experiences. And I would also argue that everybody's experience at times are going to fall kind of in that middle ground. But that's when you're asked to explain yourself. That's when your gender becomes policed in a particular way. And that can happen for, again, anybody, regardless of kind of where they fall. Um, Pause, but, if I can jump in for one second, yeah. for those listening who can't see what we're looking at, uh, yeah. I'm just gonna give a quick description. So what Pause um, has, and Karen have presented is there are uh, seven spectrums mm -hmm. on the screen. Um, and I Pause, I know you're gonna walk through them Mm -hmm. uh, one at a time, but just to give a quick overview, uh, they're assigned sex, gender identity, gender expression and presentation, gender role, sexual orientation, attraction, and legal sex. And on one side, uh, pauses, on the left-hand side, pauses placed um, male, man, or masculine um, identities. And on the right side, pauses placed female uh, or women uh, identities. So sorry, mm -hmm. just wanted to give a brief um, uh, verbal overview of what we're looking at. Yeah, I really actually appreciate that. I wasn't thinking about uh, the fact that not everybody would necessarily be able to see it, but yeah, and that even in these different kinds of dimensions, so if we think about assigned sex, we think of having two possibilities, male and female, so there's kind of where that binary is, and we assume that those are natural, and we assume that everybody's going to have an experience that necessarily falls within that. And, and, and there's an assumption that they're opposites, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's, there one can't have the other. And so, and I think the other thing that you, you can't see is that it's, it's on a line, right? Cause like on a continuum, it's on a mm -hmm. continuum. Right. And so we're, we're looking at this idea that if we're looking at male, that's enough, it's male. Right. But what we're actually seeing is that there is a, a lot, right? There's a whole line of, of this idea of maleness. And, and so when we start talking about that and, and you can see it at each level, if it's assigned sex, you can talk about whether it's based on external genitalia or chromosomes, right? If it's gender identity, it's based on, right? So we actually have a much wider and, and more full idea rather than just thinking that it's male and female and they're and they're opposite, and they're just sitting at the both ends in this very very small. Um, they actually take up much more space and have a lot more diversity to them. Yeah, and I think what happens is when we think about the term gender, we might all come up with one label that kind of describes where we think that we sit. Or if somebody asks us our gender, we might just provide one label. But really, there's a lot when there's a lot of um, concepts that really fall under that that kind of wider umbrella of gender. And so what we're see what we're seeing on the screen is all of the different things that kind of contribute to cultural conceptualizations of gender. So assigned sex is one piece. Gender identity is one piece. Gender expression is one piece of that. And each of those can be conceptualized really on their own kind of binary. And so as we're thinking about this, and as we're kind of maybe thinking about writing characters who have complex experiences of gender, it's helpful to not just think about what, where do they sit? What's their, what's their one label of gender? It's helpful to think about like, what's their, where do they fit on this map kind of in general? And what's that kind of constellation look like? And so if we take the first aspect that assigned gender, well, I think, let me, so here are the different dimensions again, sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, gender role, 
sexual orientation, sexual attraction, and legal sex, we have this concept, and I think this is part of what um, what Laura was starting to kind of bring into hold is that we have this idea that we expect all aspects of gender to align in a particular way. So we expect that if we know one, one person's experience and their sex assigned at birth, we expect then that we know something about their gender identity, their expression, and we expect all of these things to align. Um, and, and we talk about that as alignment normativity. And a lot of the discrimination that happens for people in the queer community and even people outside that queer community, the discrimination happens when people's um, experiences of gender don't line up across these different dimensions. Um, and, and it's this alignment normativity then that becomes the basis for cis normativity and for sexism and for heterosexism um, as well. So when we're thinking about assigned sex, and I'm just gonna go through these fairly quickly, but when we think about assigned sex, sex in and of itself is what people think of as being biological sex. We try not to say biological sex. Um, we talk about it as assigned sex because we recognize that there are a lot of different things that go into whether somebody is assigned male or female at birth. There's a number of biological indicators um, that um, so we might think of, of somebody's a biological indicator as being chromosomal, as being hormonal, thinking about reproductive organs. We all, and all of those experiences might contribute to appearance of genitalia. And normally assigned sex is something that is done on the basis of genitalia, right? Baby comes out, you look to see what their genitals are, and then they're kind of declared or assigned being um, male or female, or the presence of that even in utero now that they have you know, ultrasounds and other things like that. Some of our other indicators of sex, we might not even have access of, to information about. So we might not even know, I don't know, I've never seen a chromosomal uh, printout of kind of where I sit in terms of my chromosomes, right? But I'm assuming that based on what I was assigned in terms of sex. And so that example kind of illustrates the fact that often we assume different things about people's gender based on things that we can see, not that we all go around with our genitals hanging out either, right? But we all assume what that is based on assigned sex, based on all of these other things. And so it's, it's important and it's actually really an interesting thing to think about when you're writing because like we visually ID people based on different biological aspects of sex, secondary sex characteristics, those types of things. But when you're writing a character, you might, you might need to draw something visually, like an image visually, but you're gonna have to do that in words and thinking about what information are you giving and providing. And when you're doing that, you're, you're giving pieces of information that are going to play on people's assumptions of larger understandings of who that character is in terms of their gender. So that becomes also really important. And so, um, there are a number of people who have uh, a mosaic pattern among their different biological indicators of sex. And so we can talk about people who are intersex in a particular way. There's a lot of words that have been used historically about this. In, in a lot of literature, people talk about hermaphrodites. That's not seen as a, a, a term that we use now, right? That's seen as a more offensive term now. So that's a term that you might avoid. Um, in psychology, we use the term now, what's, what's seen as disorders of sex development. Um, a people or people with intersex conditions, most people in the intersex community don't prefer those terms because again, they're very um, pathologizing and um, identify as intersex. Um, but even intersex individuals, because we have such a strong binary uh, system, tend to be assigned male or female um, as well. But that again, just kind of speaks to the variation, even though we think about gender in these binary ways and we still have our language that forces people into these binary categories, that's really not the lived experience of 
most people or of, of everybody. Can um, I clarify just for a second? So when you use the term intersex individuals, that could potentially apply to a person who has uh, evidence, uh, physical evidence of both genitalia, mm -hmm. male, female, um, or identifies with something that may not be what the assigned sex at birth was, or is that right? Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting because often intersex, people who are intersex, a lot of times it is based on the presence of either ambiguous genitalia um, at birth, but there are a number of people who are assigned at birth. Nobody necessarily knows what, uh, that there's no understanding of a intersex kind of condition um, until maybe somebody hits puberty, right? And then with puberty, with, with hormones, sometimes maybe somebody doesn't menstruate. Something isn't happening um, in a typical or expected fashion. And then they figure out hey, um, you know, maybe that person doesn't have a uterus, maybe that person, and that might not be something that you know um, about, like, you don't necessarily have a scan of all of your organs right away until something happens, right? And so there are a lot of people who are in their 20s or are in their teens who um, something is happening that they, that then they find something out, they, they find that out about themselves. There's also a piece of how this is how intersex conditions have been treated in the medical community, where often parents might know that about their kids, but doctors have said, keep that information. Um, don't share that information with your child. And that's been the, the, um, the way the medical community has, ha has kind of treated that. What they'll tend to say is, We'll choose a gender. You're going to raise that kid as that gender and never tell them about their intersex condition. There's a whole history to why that's the situation, but it also makes that very difficult because a lot of intersex individuals find out about those conditions, maybe as teens or in their 20s, and then they find out that their parents have been withholding that information because that has been what um, doctors have um, suggested. And so then it feels you know, like your entire life and, and your entire family and support system has, um, has thinks that you're wrong, right? That there's something wrong with your body and, um, and also feels like it's a very shameful thing. Um, and then often having procedures without knowing why they're having procedures. Um, but again, that's that treatment in the medical condition and the medical community is, has partially been done in a way to kind of normalize gen genitals. A lot of the surgeries are to normalize the genitals because again, our idea of, of what's appropriate in a binary way is really just so strong. Um, yeah. So that's one kind of one example. Um, so other than assigned sex, which we tend to strongly either have male or female, despite the fact that that's not really the biological reality in terms of diversity, we also have the other dimension, which is gender identity. And if we think of that in binary ways, we think of that as identifying as a man or as a woman. And again, we think of that as a very kind of naturalized um, experience, but really there's a lot of different gender identities. Gender identity is the um, private experience of how you identify in terms of gender. Um, and so there's a lot of different labels that people might use. Facebook, I think there's 51 currently, 51 different options of gender identities that people might use. Um, so I have some up here on the screen, I guess for, re for people who are just listening, I'll read some of them. So they might be agender or bigender or cisgender or um, trans or genderqueer or gender variant or MTF. Those are all labels that are often used to describe somebody's private experience or their relationship to this construct of gender um, in one way or another. Um, and so Paul, so, just, just yep. to jump into that a little bit more, because I know when I first heard this, right, like assigned sex was like biological sex was yeah, of course. That's what I know growing up, right? Like you were born a boy or a girl. So the, I, the, and I can remember my father, who was a gynecologist. I remember the first time he came home was talking about delivering a baby. And I was like, well, was it a boy or a girl? And he's like, well, it's not always so black and white. 
and I was like, what? <laughs> so, so, but moving into gender identity, um, if you wouldn't mind for people who are brand new to this concept, um, because they have had a normative experience um, where their gender identity matches their assigned sex, um, talk to me a little bit more. You're talking about kind of like when you look in the mirror, what you see, is that a good description of it? Or how would, what would be a better way to uh, define gender identity? Yeah, it's really not necessarily about appearance. So looking in the mirror might be more about gender expression. But gender identity is really your private experience. It's like, how do you relate to that category? And so the textbook definitions, although I think it should be widened, is how somebody identifies with either being male, female, both, or neither, right? So this idea that you might identify in one way or another. Now, again, alignment normativity tells us that we expect that somebody who was assigned male is going to identify as a man. And somebody who is assigned female is going to identify as um, a woman. So there's kind of two pieces to this. When we think of transgender, right? When we think of transgender, the term or cisgender, the term, those are terms that have to do with the relationship between assigned sex and gender identity. So somebody who is trans is somebody who identifies with the gender that is different from what society would expect them to identify with based on their assigned sex. So trans is somebody who assigns, who identifies their gender identity is different from sociocultural expectations based on assigned sex. Somebody who's cisgender is somebody who is going to identify with a gender identity that's coincident with that, that is expected from assigned sex. So it might be somebody who was assigned female and identifies as a woman, right? That would be somebody who is cisgender or somebody who identifies as, uh, or was assigned male and identifies as male. So trans as a community or as a umbrella term kind of encompasses anybody who identifies with an, a gender identity that's different from what society would expect based on their assigned sex. So it could be somebody who was assigned male who now is, identifies as a woman, right? That, that's kind of maybe a more binary or classic kind of experience of what we think of when we think of somebody who was who is trans, right? We also have a number of people who are uh, or communities that are non-binary, where people are using genderqueer or non-binary or agender as terms um, that are their private experience of their gender identity, but w those are not the labels that, pe that society would expect based on assigned sex. Does that make sense? So trans people often have multiple labels for their identities because they might, they might identify as male or female and use a um, more binary kind of term, um, or they might also use some other terms and often they use multiple terms. So a lot of participants in my studies will talk about having like, yeah, I identify as a trans man and I often, I'm also non-binary, right? Um, so because one label doesn't really capture that nuance um, and the ways in which their gender identity just kind of doesn't match what alignment normativity or what society would necessarily expect. Can I ask uh, just clarification on uh, the term cis? I mean, when you say mm -hmm. heteronormative, I know, I know what hetero is short for. Is cis short for something or what is that? Yeah, in Latin, it kind of means same side. So you, you see it a lot like in biology, right? It's same side and trans means it's kind of moved over to the other side. So yeah. Um, and so it's interesting because cisgender, we've had the term transgender for a while. Um, cisgender is something that hasn't even been used really in the, um, even the psychological literature as long, but it was, it was important to name in a way because it's, it's showing that like, it's showing that there is that normative experience. And without having that term, it becomes really hard to explore it. And so 
cisgender becomes in some ways like the complement to the term transgender. And you can have cisgender people who identify as a woman, and you can also have transgender people who identify as a woman. So it kind of puts um, that terminology at that same level of, of kind of hierarchy, transgender and cisgender. And then you can have multiple labels that people would think of. In terms right. of and I care. love that it normalizes the use of just, so it's not just normal gender. Right? Yes. It, it actually has cis. So, so it's, I, I really like that because it's a very subtle thing, but it's powerful. It is. And it's interesting because you brought that up too before, like hearing normative. And I really love that you paralleled that with normal, right? And I always, I normally try to clarify that because normal is like, oh, what we think of as maybe being natural, right? But normative is saying, oh no, that's our assumptions that may be right or may be wrong, right? Um, and it kind of takes, it notes that power differential in some ways, but also the false power di differential that we put on it kind of in that hierarchy of language. And normative changes by culture too. Yes, so. yeah, absolutely. Um, Follow-up question. Sure. Um, so as we're talking about the definition of gender identity, we're using words like someone's personal experience and how someone identifies. Um, for those of us who have never questioned mm -hmm. our identity as it relates to our ass assignment, can you talk a little bit about how this idea of choice comes into gender identity? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's interesting because we think of whenever, whenever somebody has a non-normative identity, we think, oh, well, you chose it and you are kind of bucking the system and you are, you, where, whereas anybody who's kind of, um, I like to say, and I think you've probably heard me say this before, Laura, too, is that when I think about gender, the people who are the most unconscious about gender are cisgender people, right? Because you haven't had to think about it in the same way. The people who are the most unconscious about sexual orientation are heterosexual people. And the people who are the most unconscious about race are white people, right? Um, and that probably stings if you have that normative identity, right? But you haven't had to defend it and you haven't had to explore it and you haven't had to develop an origin story around it, right? Um, and when you have a normative identity, a non-normative identity, you're constantly being asked, well, how did you know? And I don't know, maybe you just knew, right? And maybe most cis people just know their identities and most straight people just know their identities, but they're not asked to explain it. But if you were asked daily to explain it, you would probably quickly come up with a, a little anecdote to explain to other people, like, this is how I know, right? And a way of kind of coming up with that. And so for me, it it feels to people who have normative identities like you're choosing it because you have these words and you're stating it and you have this origin story and it's like, and then I knew, but really you only have that story because you've been forced to explore it um, to a particular way. And because the ways that we have to identify ourselves are against normative experience. So it's not about, oh, here's who I am as somebody who's agender. It's, here's who I am and here's how I know I'm not cis, right? And you have to like use language to make that make sense to cis people so that they think that your gender label is valid in a particular way. And that's, I think the really hard thing about it. So it might feel like choice, but it's really, it, it's it's very different. And it's, it's interesting, Laura, because I, I know that, um, I've done this activity with you multiple times, right? And I've explained my gender identity in very different ways in different times. And probably the next time I do it, I'll, I'll explain it e differently in another time. So I know that the first time I did this with you, I said, my gender identity is just not very salient to me. I didn't put a label to it, but I was like, it's just not very salient to me. And the last time that I did it, I was like, I really identify as agender because 
it's not that salient to me. I put a different label to it. It wasn't really that my experience of gender has changed, but the way that I've chosen to put it in that space or the words that I've kind of used, but knowing very much that how I use those words and how I choose to use those words is going to situate me really differently in terms of how somebody is going to understand who I am based on the words that I use. Um, and I thought that that was a, I, I think that's just an interesting, that's part of that kind of context where it feels fluid and where you're code switching and you're thinking differently about the, the words that you use. And it might feel like a choice, but it's really a nuance about how you're in that moment or in that situation or in that time feeling comfortable putting yourself out there in a particular way. Thank you for going into that. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, for anyone listening at home um, who has maybe never given their gender th uh, any thought, um, I just I just want to echo something that um, Paz said um, because gender identity is something that we are all choosing. We're either choosing the identity that's assigned to us and we're like embracing that or we're not. But I, I just wanna make sure that no one at home is taking this idea of identity or um, like this personal choice related to identity and making it like, well, you're choosing to go against mm -hmm. societal norms. And for those of you who can't see me at home, I'm using some air quotes there. Um, but I, I do think that there's, um, especially historically, there's been a lot of like controversy around identity and orientation and those things being choice versus biological mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. So I just appreciate you spending that little extra time on that just to make sure people who are thinking about this for the first time, because I do remember like the first time this <laughs> became a conversation for me, um, there were a lot of questions about, well, um, and, and you, you and uh, Karen both brought this up at the beginning, like in order to understand people with non-normative idea uh, um, identities, if you have a normative identity, you need to go back and you need to explore your mm -hmm. own identity because at some point, like you're making a choice more as it relates to expression and presentation and gender roles, but like you're making choices um, every day. Um, so just maybe from that standpoint, um, stop othering people um, as it relates to some of these things, so. Yeah, and I think the other thing too is if you're writing characters who have normative identities, explore some of that too, because it's, it's you don't only want to explore the complexity of gender with people who are non-normative because it, I don't think that cis people are any less diverse than, than trans people. It's just that they don't have the language and they're not forced to push it and explain it and, and make it part of the social context that they're navigating. And so um, I think one of the things when Jeff, when we were first even talking about this and thinking about writing gender diversity, I think one of the biggest things that Karen and I talked about is that like, yes, this could be a great way to learn and think about the diversity of, of trans and non-binary communities, but it's also, if you're only doing that to diversify the way that you're thinking about transness or LGBT identities, then you're really not doing, you're, you're only doing half the, the story and you're also probably tokenizing the community by not also exploring gender diversity among cis identities and, and um, straight identities as well. Yeah, I think that to pause just something that I've learned from uh, my relationship with um, you and Karen is that my, like we've been saying, just to reiterate what everyone's already said, um, my uh, upbringing that tells me there is just a man or woman, that this isn't a spectrum, but almost like a checkbox. Um, like you're saying, prevents me from having to actually explore who I am and um, creates in me pressure on others to, to check one box or the other. So um, 
and even whether or not I was aware of seeing gender identity as a checkbox, whether or not I was aware of how that impacted others, it does. My awareness is not in question. Like my awareness is not important in when it comes to how it's impacting other people. So I appreciate you really digging into the idea that gender identity is a spectrum and that it's not just check male or check female, that there is a, a large variant between, um, there's a large uh, diversity in how people see themselves and understand their gender. And that the only reason we use male and female is because that is the history from which we have come, not because that is correct. So just to, just to kind of affirm what you're saying and uh, express some appreciation for you spending time here and kind of breaking this out for us. Can I, well, I can I, oh, I'm sorry. You no, know, I was just gonna add one thing real quick is that it's also by creating a checkbox we're also reinforcing it, right? We're also reinforcing that binary. We're also telling people that there's times in which they should never step outside of it. And we feel the ramifications and the repercussions of doing that, even if you're not trans or non-binary, there might've been a time in a, in a history where um, being a cisgender person or being a, um, a heterosexual person, you remember getting a little too close to that line, right? Because we're, our, our, our social and cultural norms are reinforced from a young age, right? It's not just, hey, we said it when you came out, what, what your genitalia look like. We're gonna need to know what bathroom you go in. We are gonna need to know where to place you. We're gonna need to make sure um, that, you know, when you're in fourth grade and you're square dancing, we know where to put you, you know, when, when in gym, where you're, what, what locker room you go in. We have to organize you in a certain way and we do it and reinforce that all the time. And so- Because if by, you're different, you're dangerous. Yeah, that's what we say. If you're different, True. you're dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think yeah, I wanted. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add for, for writers who are confused about what um, engaging with the definition of, you know, cisgender is in your writing, what this can often look like is um, challenging the alpha male stereotype, mm -hmm. um, engaging with men who are vulnerable, which we, especially in romance, we don't often allow representation of that. It can be, you know, the tom girl. Um, these are all really common um, patterns that are still allowed for in some cases in our cisgendered narrative in at least North America. Um, but those are the, if you're looking for a starting point, I would say that those are some easily accessible ways to engage with that. Yeah, and um, I think that what you're speaking to too gets to kind of the other dimensions. Like we're kind of talking about gender identity, which is your private experience, but then there's other pieces of how do we express ourselves? What's our gender expression? What are our gender roles? And those are those are things that vary for trans, non-binary, and cis people as well. Um, um, I was going to draw an example from my own writing because I think it may be pertinent for writers uh, at least. Is I'm, I'm um, in terms of cultural norms. Uh, you know, my partner Liz is downstairs right now doing renovations on the house, whereas I'm the one who'll cry at the drop of a hat. Uh, you know, a, a sad television uh, commercial comes on and I'll just weep, in, you know, because it's so beautiful. So, I mean, very much we, we uh, ascribe to non-normative <laughs> behaviors for society. In an early beta reader from one of my novels, when I had my guy who happens to be a, a werewolf, fall on his knees crying in front of the woman that he lost. Uh, it's all heterosexual, but he's very much not doing the normal male thing. And I had readers that really balked at that, like, well, how could this alpha, alpha male guy do that? And I actually use that and I doubled down on, no, 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 he is a sensitive guy. And that is, that's his character. And I want to stay true to it, maybe because it was based a little bit on myself. But then that also gave me... Um, a marketing, uh, he's an alpha wolf, but a beta human. Uh, and, and so that actually worked in a, in like, it was, I initially balked at him like, oh my God, I did something wrong. I made the guy cry because he's upset. That doesn't happen. No, it does happen. And so I just found that as you guys are talking about this, I'm, I'm coming back to this whole realization is what I needed to do was probably develop his character in a way that you would 
find it natural that he would have done that rather than it seeming to come out of nowhere. So that was something that I was like, oh, now I have to go back and explore that character in more detail and make it more multidimensional. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And also to know, to know that the audience, um, is sometimes you're, you're pulling them along, right? Sometimes no matter who it is and how well developed that character is, they're going to be that things are just, that's just not supposed to happen. But by adding that richness and diversity, you're saying it can. And when you're, and when you introduce one example of it, it's real, right? And so people can start to envision it and say, I guess it can happen because I remember this, even if it's just through a character or a story, you start to um, challenge that idea of what you think is gonna happen and what should always happen. And I think for me, it's funny because I talk about many times in which um, gender or the way my gender is perceived has been um, a, a really vulnerable and, uh, and, and, and hard experience. But I also talk about the fact that like, um, you know, when you, they have, there, there's these kind of images you have that like um, a man will go to the park caring for his child and everyone's like, wow, you're the best dad. And, oh, you know, it's like these kind of very reinforced things that like, I actually get reinforced all the time as someone is who, once I sold it, right, once they bought in to the idea that I was on this masculine v um, side or on this maleness to, to people's side, then all of a sudden the fact that I cook, the fact that I do dishes, mm -hmm. I mean, pause has really lucked out, you know? So it's like, it's so ingrained in us that like when we start doing this alignment normativity, we start pushing this idea that like, once you get someone to believe it, it still happens, right? If like, no, people are not still asking me what body parts I have, but then they're like, okay, I bought into that. And now I'm still gonna push this maleness on you. And I'm still gonna reinforce the fact that like doing a domestic chore um, or having some responsibility within the home is like, you know, has never been more an astonishment, amazement and things like that. So, you know, I mean, I think it's it's kind of what Paz says sometimes where it's like, you have to look on the other coin, not that, the discrimination is very real um, and more so even if I had other non-normative intersections of identity like race or things like that but for me there's this strange juxtaposition that when you when people do buy into it they, it's still the desire to make it that make you fit into this very um like normative thing so what's well, oh my god that's so so true Thank you. Yeah, when, when people talk about like a same sex marriage, people are, or a same sex, uh, people are like, are you the one that wears a dress? Like which one, like they still want to ascribe these really heteronormative and these very male, female kinds of roles, even when that's not really relevant. The whole point is that there maybe isn't a man in that whole situation, but we're still trying to like impose these particular ideas. And it's that relative it. thing. It's that like, I want to understand it. So if I'm understanding it in my context, please explain it to me in my world, right? Yeah, so take yeah. what you're saying and tell me, break it down in a way in which I can understand it. Whereas what, the reality what? is there doesn't need to be a man in the relationship. There right. doesn't need to be a woman in the relationship. That's a construct. Wow. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing too, is we're starting to talk around like we talked about gender identity it was just, just like how you identify with it. And now we're starting to talk around these other two dimensions of, of thinking about gender. And one is gender expression, right? And that's kind of how you express yourself in terms of being more masculine or feminine, right? And you can sit at any gender identity and, and present or express in a really masculine way or in a really feminine way or some kind of combination, right? So gender expression often has to do with how you're being read by other people. It might have to do with um, the clothes you wear or your mannerisms that um, doesn't necessarily tell you anything about somebody's gender identity. I think one of the things that people think when they think about trans and particularly non-binary people, they think that if you identify as non-binary, you have to be super androgynous in your gender expression, right? That you can identify as non-binary and present more masculine or more feminine. And so that expectation, again, of alignment in one way or another. So that's the expression piece. And then role, 
is more, it could be personality trait, it could be occupation, it could be the division of labor, like you kind of were speaking to, like what are the, the roles that you play in one way or another. And so for Karen and I, it's interesting as a, um, as you know, as a couple in some ways that people will look at us and say, okay, I might, I present in a more feminine way than Karen does. And so they expect, and this is part of what Karen was speaking to is that then they expect that because Karen presents more masculine, then they should have a particular gender role that matches that in a particular way. So, but gender identity, gender expression and gender role all vary, can vary independently. And so if you're attending and understanding that gender encapsulates all of those things, there's so many different ways to divert, there's so many different ways to be a human, right? And to express gender in all of these really I think wonderful ways that is that can be really, really freeing. It's one of the things that I enjoy the most about being a queer person is that in some ways, uh, in some ways this gender binary doesn't work, right? And so when we think about our division of labor as a couple, it's not a gendered thing. It's like, who's good at what? And so I often think about my gender role as seeming more masculine in some ways, because for the majority of our, our relationship, I've been the one who has worked outside the home and Karen's gender role might be more kind of leaning more in the feminine role because they cook and they stayed home with our kids and they did all of this, but really it just means that Karen kind of does everything and I work outside the home, right? Like, but, but we've arranged things based on discussion and what we want to do with our lives and how we, um, you know, like how we want to organize our home, not based on you do that because you're the woman or you're supposed to do that because you're the man. So there's a freedom a lot in giving um, and not giving power to that binary and that and that fluidity i mean mm -hmm. i think we kind of talk about the fact that like when we're presenting um you know the the characters and, and you're presenting um and i'm sure as most of you were speaking uh, you were pulling out specific characters or popping in your own minds i think and in your own writing um so you'll probably be able to speak to this uh, even more as we kind of move into other parts of the conversation but this idea that like once we've established a character <clears throat> in a specific dress or style or representation that they can never move, right? That we don't all have times where we are um, doing different things in different contexts, right? Where we're like in an athletic setting and we're not wearing um, a dress or a tux, right? If we're, if, you know, like, cause we, we have that fluidity at some point um, based on social appropriateness. And so we can say that like, if we took the shorts from a basketball team in the male basketball team in the 60s and we tried to put them on the shorts uh, in of kids right now they'd be like oh this is what you know and it's like suddenly now it's not male appropriate suddenly now that doesn't fit in our context because we're also having this this evolution and we're also having this we're also having fashion and other parts of society that gets to tell us what is male at this point and and it can change and it's it, right now your your shorts should go past your knees and other times it you they were you know and women's bathing suits and this and that and it's so we're hearing this idea of of expression and presentation specifically has this like external cultural and depending on what culture and Western culture or otherwise, right, we're having this appropriateness of what is uh, what is appropriate for a female, what is appropriate for a, um, a male, and and kind of where you should sit in that, right? Because when we go into a store, nothing really makes a T-shirt male, right? It's going to be what's on it. It's going to be a color. It's going to be because it was sitting in that section that says male over top or boy, you know, so, but we're ascribing these, th these things to really inanimate objects. We're, we're telling them that that's only suitable. And if we watch the progress progression over time, somehow it's been able to change, right? We've all accepted that what we wear in the, in the 60s, maybe maybe it comes back again, people are bell-bottoming or something, but you know, ultimately we accept 
that what somebody else tells us all the time, what is, what should be very maleness and it, because it's reinforced by our society, because we know when we wear something that's not, you know, we, we're if, told when it's not appropriate, right? We're, to, we're told when a, a man wears pink and then now it's like, oh no, pink doesn't matter. I'm so secure in my masculinity. I can wear pink from head to toe. Right? So it just depends on how we're claiming that and who told us that it's okay and how it was reinforced that it was okay. And so when we try to step outside of it, it's like, how much flack will I get for doing that? And, and that, and that goes back to that idea of just like, where you are and who you're with. And, and so, yeah, I think that you see that a lot in gender expression and presentation and gender role because it's out there for others to consume, critique and judge. I, I'd just add that when y'all first said to me, gender roles are uh, like roles that people have are gendered. My, my initial, like, this was years and years ago, my initial response was like, no, they're not. And then, <laughs> but then as I thought about it, I was like, oh my gosh, they so are. <laughs> it's just funny. Like, it feels like um, for, you know, if you grew up like me, where um, there, there was a hard line presented for what gender is, and it was, you know, the check boxes one side or the other. And um, you just kind of assumed that like, yeah, this is all part of it. And so it, it, I just, I find it eye opening. I see it everywhere now, right? Like I was just this week, uh, I was watching the TV show Bridgerton on Netflix and the more masculine sister is the one that is like intelligent and wants to read and wants to go to school. And I'm sitting there watching and I'm like, wait, why are those roles assigned to the more masculine character, right? Like it's that kind of like, you know, it, that forcing of, um, the genderization of roles. So just to go back to part of what you said earlier, just to reinforce it for those who, like me, may feel like this is the first time they're hearing this and it's it's, it's crazy town. Um, <laughs> this idea that roles are gendered, like Karen was saying, is cultural, right? Like just to summarize what you were saying, it's, it's a cultural expectation that we've placed upon roles. And we, ha as a culture, have said, we consider this role to be more masculine, but it's not like written in a book somewhere. It's not something that was like determined, like these are the things that are masculine. We're calling these roles masculine and, gen and feminine because we are part of a specific culture that has labeled them that things, but that like Karen was saying, they change over time and over location. And, um, you know, for example, I grew up in the South, men cooking in the South is is an acceptable masculine role as long as you're cooking outside that's the like <laughs> you can you, the men can do the crawfish broil but it has to happen outside right like but if you're like cooking dinner every day well suddenly it's a feminine thing right like and all that is is like a cultural expectation that my geographic location placed on cooking right so sorry just wanted to jump in there and emphasize a little bit of what you were saying yeah, and it's such a powerful thing, too, because you can't say, like, in second grade, we had a class where we learned all of these things, right? So it's so subtle, and it's so, and so I think as writers, it's really hard because it's that nuance. It's subtle, but it's pervasive it's because true. it's everywhere, right? It so everything reinforces it, like, mm -hmm. and all of our relationships reinforce it. Like, we learn it from our parents. We learn it when we walk into the store and see what's appropriate boys and girls clothing, mm -hmm. or you walk into a toy aisle and you recognize what are the ones that look like Pepto-Bismol pink, right? And what are the ones that look like primary colors? And you might not tell a kid which one is the appropriate one, but they know, right? And they get these, these subtle, but also hit you over the head cues Absolutely. about I mean, what's important. Even from, from before a child is born, right? What, what's your kid? Because I can only get it a blue blanket. I can only get it, you know, like, so it, it is subtle and it's, pervasive but then when you're doing it in a in a story with characters mm -hmm. and you have to decide the words in which you're using to introduce it um i'll 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 um say that i we were fortunate enough to actually uh listen to the podcast that um you all did earlier on the on gender um and it was it was great and i loved hearing this you, you know um you all talking about it in terms of like characters and um and writing and really telling people because i heard at one point um that 
that I think JP, you said you, you don't run into a room and scream your orientation, right? And so you kind of have to find a way of like, how do you capture this subtle mm -hmm. nuance that's pervasive in a story? And so I really loved, uh, we really loved hearing mm -hmm. that part. Um, and, and in general, just kind of what's out there because it is a challenging thing that at times can seem so daunting. You're just like, well, why, why start? If I do it, don't do it right, I'm gonna, it, or if I, I wanna do it right and I, I don't want it to be a disservice, right? And so I wanna, um, and so how to start writing this out and how to start integrating it. Um, so it, th those are questions that I'm, I guess I'd pose, but they have no answer to, but it is like, you know, um, how, how do you do it without reinforcing these very, um, you know, the, these ideas that like, if it's a lesbian, they're going to be, uh, they're, they're going to be in boots with some kind of plaid, right? If it's, <laughs> we're going to hypersexualize it because we don't know how to talk about some kind of sexuality without making sure that it might not be appropriate for them to walk into a room and scream it, but if they go to pick up someone at a bar, you'll immediately know that they're gay, right? So we find subtle ways to try to reinforce it, but then we're also reinforcing these align the, the alignment of this is what you should be and, and playing on the assumptions. And so it is a challenging thing to kind of take on. I have a question that, that uh, kind of stems off that, and that is like a, a very current times need question. Societally, for for readers, for society, right now, where do you feel the balance lies as far as how explicitly you engage, like the society needs engagement as far as the book that's coming to mind, and I'm saying this so complicated because I don't have the clarity in my brain about this. Um, the book that comes to mind immediately is, um, there's a book called Deeds of Poxenarian, or a series by Elizabeth Moon. And the character is queerded, um, asexual, possibly aromantic, but because in this world, like those weren't necessarily anything that ever was stated explicitly, it's coded. It is never said explicitly on the page. Um, how, because there's this, there is again a spectrum of how explicitly you can engage with this as a writer, um, and all of them are valid engagements depending on the story you're going to tell. But is there a level that you feel is needed more right now, um, as far as how explicitly this is engaged with versus subtly coded? I don't, I don't even know if there's an answer to this, but I'm really curious in, in what you think. I think there's a lot of, and this is just my first kind of thought, and who knows if I'll change it after we get off of this conversation, but my first thought is there's a lot of value in some ways in, there's a lot of mistakes that you can make in being really explicit, right? Because once you're explicit, it situates in one particular place and there's a lot of ways to maybe do that wrong and there's a lot of ways that you could also do that right i think there's a lot of interesting ways of kind of being open it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier about just leaving things neutral not having to say not having to say things or um not having to situate them so specifically, but making it clear that maybe it's not normative, right? Like opening up that possibility or not drawing these really strong gendered assumptions and leaving things open for the possibility. Because I think one thing that happens is that readers are gonna, if, if things aren't so gendered, readers are gonna place themselves also in that and see if, if there's variability in the parameters in which you're writing about gender and you say partner, then people might, multiple readers might assume in different ways, right? And you allow that imagination to be open. And then maybe you do bring a cue in later to be like, okay, this is how they identify. But it doesn't have to be that like, it's explicit, if, especially if somebody's non-normative, that every time you're talking about them, you're talking about the ways that their gender is you know, being negotiated in that space rather than just opening the container, <laughs> opening the container to be more neutral and to not have those gendered assumptions. I think there's a lot of play in that. And there's a lot of, um, 
um, it just gives space for the possibility in a way that what I tend to see is there's, there's um, stories that are written from these very gendered assumptions where people might not even know and think that they're writing a gendered story because they're just writing, you know, kind of unconsciously the stories that we kind of tell in society, right? And then there's people who are like, I want to make a queer character or I want to make a non-normative character. And so now I'm going to move and I'm going to take all that language of that community and make sure that I kind of get that in there, which can feel really empowering to have a, a like this very queer centered kind of story. But again, I think now we're creating another binary, right? We're creating literature or images that are absent of diversity. And then we're saying, now I'm gonna write something that is the most diverse or that is very consciously diverse and is engaging in that, which I think there's a lot of value for. But I also think that there's a ton of value in being like, yeah, I'm gonna write a story where maybe, gen maybe, maybe the ways in which people are re interacting with one another is just not following a gendered script. And we're not really labeling what their gender identity is. There's so much about gender too, that's social. Like when we were talking about having, you know, like somebody having a baby, right? Like you imagine if that baby is a boy versus a girl, you imagine a particular relationship that you're gonna have with them, right? We, we, we bring ourselves, and, and I think we all do this, we want to know who we're interacting with because we know we're going to bring a different aspect of ourself if that person is male or female because it either feels safe because it's socially appropriate to bring ourselves in that way. And so I think there's a lot of play in um, opening up a lot of these other dimensions without feeling like I have to write a diverse character right now. Um, and so I don't know, that's my gut reaction. Those are the stories that I think I would be interested in. I'm always wondering like, what would it be like to interact with people where I don't have to be this self-conscious, where I don't have to wonder. Um, it's just kind of, I can read a situation and read that those assumptions aren't gonna be so policed. And that feels really freeing to me. So maybe that's me selfishly being like, that's the literature that I wanna read. Um, uh, rather than I just, I need to have a character who has all of my same identities and is gonna tell my story. I mean, I don't necessarily feel like, I've never read a story like that. And maybe that would be fun for me, but I'm not, I'm looking for something that's also gonna let me imagine kind of a world beyond this. And I know a lot of you are also writing kind of in the more like sci-fi also kinds of things that allow for and have allowed for um, gender. But it, even if when you said kind of romance, I'm thinking like there's such a intimacy, right? When we're, when we're thinking about romance or we're thinking about our social relationships, there's intimacy that's so gendered and to play with like, what would that space look like where I, I don't even know, but I would love to read a book that makes me be like, wow, I, Jeanette Winterson, I don't know if you've ever read, I can't remember the book, but it's a book where um, it's a kind of a love story and you actually never know the gender of the um, narrator. And it's, and, and you know that they're in love with somebody and they're talking about this person and you have no idea the gender of the people, but the love story is so strong. And for me, that was like, anybody could kind of place themselves there and not get locked into a gendered way of interacting. And I think that so. that comes down to like, when I was saying earlier, is like the intention, right? Like the intentionality of mm -hmm. the situation, like, you know, cause I think I, if you, you know, if you watch, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the documentaries, Disclosure, or mm -hmm. a couple other ones that are out there, right? You're going to see this chronicling of representation. You're going to see what it's like to introduce characters um, and at what point in which, like, people will accept characters, right? Will accept um, 
you know, uh, prostitutes will accept you in this, in this role, but if you're that role, no, 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 that doesn't make sense to me, right? So there always has to be a first, right? And so there always has to be this, um, but I think the intention of writing it, right? So, you know, as a reader and a consumer, I've been finding um, stories of, of tomboys or, you know, people that I found that I could connect to in story, whether they really shared my identity or not, it was just, they were placed, right? Because I was looking for that. I was looking for a connection. Um, if you're an author, I think for me, um, I, I often remind myself that that character can't be um, everything to everyone, right? And so that, you know, you have to be okay with telling a, a part of that story. Um, and I think, but if you are writing a story because it needs to be, um, because it, it makes sense to be subtle and it makes sense that it is just one aspect of their whole identity and then that's good, right? If you're writing the aspect of that story because you're subtle, because you're hoping that part of the queer community picks up on the vibe that they're kind of, right? You know, like I, we hear, um, you know, in the uh, Harry Potter series, right? Where there's like subtle, like, yeah, I mean, if you're in the gang, you kind of knew that, uh, you know, Dumbledore was queer or something like that, right? So like, but if you didn't, it was subtle enough that you could miss it. It didn't piss people off, right? So like, it was just like, is that your intention? Um, and if it is, okay and own it but it's like it's the muddled in between that gets mm -hmm. uncomfortable it gets tokenizing because you're like hey i'd really like to reach a wider audience okay um that's not a horrible reason to do it right if you're if you want to tell a story because people deserve to have stories out there and to see themselves in the world great it's but it's really that you have to spend the time to be intentional because i think you know, Mark mentioned it earlier when somebody questioned questioned you um, about your character, your werewolf, right? And it's like, what what is the intention? What, why did we make those decisions, right? And and so I think when we um, we we had a training not too long ago, and there was a whole conversation about like why would we put our pronouns in our signature line? Mm -hmm. Why why would we do that? And so we talked about you know, normalizing the experience and making sure that you weren't just asking some people, but all people that you were saying that by email, really in a, without, it's all assumption, right? If, if my name is um, something that we would perceive as always being um, feminine, right? If I'm, I'm Karen, right? But if I'm Kelly, well, there, it could be a man or a woman, right? We, we start to see certain names that we're not sure, right? If we're seeing Lee, L-E-E -E or L-E-I-G-H, right? If we're, we're starting to see these names, like how does that benefit other people, right? How does that, and, and also these ideas that um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're creating this, um, that idea that it is that it's normalized, that, that everyone's doing. I'm not asking you because you're a special case. I'm not asking you because I couldn't figure you out, right? It's like, um, and because I don't want to make assumptions. I want to make space for everyone. So I think it's that intentionality for me over why you're choosing to do it. And if somebody asked you why you put your pronoun there, is it an authentic answer? Like, you know, because if it's the answer that I, I just, you know, I want people to know how to address me, Great. If it's an answer, you know, whatever that answer is, it's okay uh, to some degree, uh, as long as you have one. I think, it, yeah, I think it speaks back to that idea of also being really conscious. So we talked about like the idea of, okay, when we're thinking about gender, cisgender people tend to be unconscious about gender. So if you're writing gender and you're really thinking about it in this multidimensional way, can you also defend your character? Can you define your character in a conscious way? Because then they'll kind of come to life. But if you're writing gender in a unconscious way, you're probably going to rely on all those stereotypes. And you're actually probably going to just keep saying this, telling the same story as well, because you're going to tell this very scripted, heterosexual, cisgender kind of story. But I think if, as you open the space, 
allowing yourself or doing whatever that research is to be more conscious so that you can answer those questions when people do come back to you and say, hey, well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem legit. You have a, an alpha character who's crying, that, but you were able to answer it because you, were, you had a, a consciousness of why you were writing it that way. And so I think that as you write more diversely, thinking of and challenging yourself to be more conscious of um, maybe the more privileged positions where you're coming from, if you're pulling yourself kind of out of that would, um, would be helpful because then I think, then you are more nuanced. What I find about, what I love about my research in the queer community is that queer people have a really, have the language because they've been asked so many times, their language and their understanding of sexuality is really strong. They can tell you things that straight people haven't, because they haven't been challenged about it. It's not that they don't have the diversity, they just don't have the language for it yet. And so I think becoming more, um, becoming more conscious of it and allowing even questioning your own genders and sexualities and your own, all of these things, not just gender and sexuality, but thinking about how, do, how does your gender expression read? When do you modify that and why? And how do you show up differently? How do people react to you differently when you present in one way versus the other or when you're in a role that's different from the other, um, that that becomes really important. Um, and I think, and I think we see that in gender, but then, and what we haven't really got to yet is this idea of ori sexual orientation and attraction. And I think there's where oftentimes, like Laura was mentioning earlier, yeah. we get this, we get it conflated, right? Because we base your sexual orientation on whoever you're, you are dating's gender and your gender, right? Or, uh, you know, so this is how we start to see that. And the difference between having an orientation and an attraction is, is very, um, is a recognizable difference and, and charted differently. Okay, on yeah, that note, I'm gonna pause us. Um, that was beautiful, but before we get into orientation and attraction, yep. let's take a five, we've been sitting for an hour yep. and 45 minutes. Let's take a um, seven minute break and uh, come back in seven minutes and pick up where we left off. Is that okay with everybody? That's perfect. All right, I'm gonna pause the recording and we'll come back in seven minutes from now. In writing, do you want me Oh, you already turned the recording back on. I turned the recording back on. Yeah, but you do this thing where you go, I'm going to turn the recording back on. Is everybody okay with that? Oh, wait, it's already on. If anybody like it. That is what I do. <laughs> All right. Well, now it's on the recording. Um, I, I had a thought about responsive, like writer's responsibility um, as it re relates to diverse characters. Um, it's not just about the characters themselves that we are responsible for. It's about the characters around the diverse characters that we have to make sure um, that we're being responsible for. Um, you know, there's this idea of um, somebody brought it up a little while ago that like we don't just run into rooms um, and shout our identities and Karen and Paz talked a lot earlier um, when we first started about this idea of code switching and most of the time that code switching happens for from a safety perspective um, if I'm understanding correctly it's like this I'm negotiating because of um, you know and JP you shared a little bit of your experiences like that as well um, so I, I think that I, I kind of have two thoughts as it relates to our responsibility as writers. The first one is that if we're creating characters and we want to put their identity out into the world, then we're responsible for everybody else's reaction to it. And if you, um, Karen mentioned the disclosure documentary on Netflix, um, historically the response to trans characters in media as it relates to disclosure is horrifying and that's like creating this idea in the world and for a long time there was like a defense that you could murder a trans individual if they didn't disclose their identity to you early enough like and and these these are terrible things that are happening in the world so like as writers it's our responsibility to um, show an acceptance in our in our world 
um, not just for who our characters are, but in the way that they're being perceived. And not to say that we shouldn't create um, authentic experiences because minorities of every persuasion, whether it's racism, ethnicity, um, gender, uh, ableism, any sort of minority group, like they, there are terrible experiences, but there needs to kind of be this, this flip side to it where we're also showing an acceptance and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I guess that's both of my thoughts together. I feel like there was a discreet second thought, but I kind of got distracted by it. So, um, but that's, that's just kind of my thought as it relates to writing diversity in characters. Yeah, I, um, I think we can, we can try to take you through. So we've talked in some ways about the different dimensions of gender, assigned sex, gender identity, talked through gender expression, gender role. And the reason that there's these two other dimensions that have to do with sexuality and, and Laura, you said it is that like we often conflate sexual orientation or sexuality and gender. Um, I'm putting them in kind of the mix here because the way that we set, we talk about sexual orientation um, and sexuality is gendered inherently. Um, and so the nomenclature that we use is rooted on a gender binary. Um, and so there's in some ways that might be part of the reason why that conflation kinds of occurs. And so I think it's important to include it in this dimension so that we can see how it is discrete. So when we think about sexual orientation, it's kind of similar to how we think about gender identity. When we think about sexual identity, it is the, um, and actually when we think about sexual orientation, we think about it as including behavior, attraction, right, and identity. And so when we're thinking about sexual identity, it's your own private experience and your own labels that you might put to what's meaningful for you in terms of um, your sexuality. The labels that we traditionally use are based, it's, it's interesting because it's the only identity that we have that's, that the label that you're choosing is based on somebody else's identity, right? So for you to have a sexual orientation label, you have to identify yourself in a traditional way on a binary gender and the people who you're attracted to on a binary gender and the labels that we use speak to how well those align. So somebody who is heterosexual is going to identify with one, like as a woman who is attracted then to a man, right? Or a man who's attracted to a woman, but it's presupposing that binary identification. When we think of somebody who's gay, again, we're thinking of somebody who identifies as a man who is attracted to men. Right, so we're taking that label, expecting gender binary for both the person and the other, and bi would be the idea that it's somebody who is um, attracted to both. Notice again that it's still only expecting that you can be male or female in a particular way. All of the other label, there are a lot of other labels that kind of get us outside of that binary. We can think about pansexual, we can think about queer. I will say that bi is not inherently binary, right? So that just because somebody identifies as bi doesn't necessarily mean that they subscribe to a gender binary, although that's a stereotype that we often have of um, bisexual individuals. But because of that binary and because of that conflation and because of alignment normativity, we expect that if we know what your gender identity is, that we, we know what would be appropriate for your, sexual, for your sexual identity because of that alignment normativity, that's the basis of heterosexism. And it's part of why sexuality often gets included kind of in this matrix of, of gender mapping in one way or another. So we have sexual identity, um, again, which is your own private kind of um, identity label for your sexuality, which may or may not easily fall from your attraction. So, right, you could have two people who have different spectrums in terms of who they're attracted to and have the same label. Or you could have two people who have different labels but have the same attraction kinds of levels. And so just because somebody um, identifies as heterosexual doesn't mean that they don't have some same sex attraction or attraction to people of other genders. Um, and so 
again, that reliance, that deep, deep reliance of defining sexuality based on gender is what aligns it in this way, which is really interesting because I often do an activity with people and I just say, you know, what are you attracted to in people? And often gender is not the first thing that people say. They'll say, oh, you know, sometimes they'll say body parts, I'm a butt person or I like boobs or whatever. But like a lot of times people are like, I really, I'm just really attracted to sense of humor. I really love when somebody is, you know, like a lot of times attraction really isn't based on gender in any way, but our system culturally of defining sexuality around gender is what allows us in some ways to easily kind of conflate this idea of sexual um, sexuality and um, gender in, in another way. Um, when we're looking at these different aspects of gender, um, all of which we see kind of on a binary, we really see that alignment normativity where we expect if we know assigned sex that we think that gender identity should um, align with that, that's kind of the basis of cis normativity, right? The idea that we think that if we know assigned sex that we know what the appropriate gender identity would be. We see sexism embedded in it. We think that if we know your gender identity, we know what is the appropriate gender role or the appropriate gender expression. Right, and then we see the heterosexuality embedded in this kind of system, this binary system, where we think if we know your gender, we know what's appropriate in terms of your sexuality or attraction. Um, and so seeing kind of this completeness, it, it allows you to see the power dimension of gender. So it allows us to see that there's so much variability for everybody, but that power comes in when we start kind of enforcing our assumptions of alignment normativity on other individuals. And then the only last piece that we have kind of on this matrix or this map is this idea of legal sex, which is um, this idea that, and that sometimes we expect that legal sex is the same thing as assigned sex, but it's really about what your documents say your gender to be. Often those documents and a lot of documents uh, enforce a gender binary. So birth certificates, um, passports, those types of things. We actually live in Maryland and in Maryland now on your driver's license, you can have a legal sex of X. Um, and so there's not, it's not always binary, but for a lot of trans and non-binary individuals, um, a lot of times when you change your documents, you might have multiple documents that have different um, legal gender markers. And often that puts you in a compromised situation. Also, if you're somebody who is um, trans, who is like a trans man, for example, but um, your identity marker says female on your documents, that's something that becomes a safety concern and it's something that could kind of also out you. It, um, your gender marker on your medical insurance, those types of things also really dictate what types of healthcare um, you're able to have and are really the source of a lot of discrimination um, because your legal documents in a lot of ways can out um, your trans status in a particular way. And so I, I love thinking about gender um, because it in this map kind of way, because it allows us to really interrogate the ways in which that gender binary doesn't capture lived experience really of any community, but also helps us identify the source of discrimination and the source of um, other parts of experiences when you fall in non-normative identities and how those kind of come to play, particularly because our expectations of all these different aspects of gender, we expect them to line up. Um, in one way or another. We were gonna, I think we're gonna skip doing our own gender maps. Oh, how do I do this? But I did wanna show you one thing. Yeah, I think we can go through. Pause just before you skip doing gender maps, sure. because I know this was important. Um, you know, just thinking through people who might be hearing this for the first time, just to kind of sum up what you've been talking about when we look at these seven seven spectrums mm -hmm. it's highly unlikely that someone is going to fall entirely on one side of the spectrum yeah. right because e even like 
myself, oh, you have pictures of it. Okay, that's, I'll just let you talk. I'll yeah, be that's quiet. exactly what yeah. I was just going to pull up. What what I'm showing you here is a um, gender map of just people from my class last semester, um, and 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 there were plenty of people who had all different identities. And you notice, and there were a lot of people who were cisgender and heterosexual. And what you notice is when they mapped out their own um, experiences, nobody actually had the up and down expectation of everything aligning up really neatly. And so I think that that's such an important thing because we want to think about gender diversity and think, oh, that's that's a that's something that, like, that happens in the queer community. But no, it actually happens for everybody. And so I think that's where it's really helpful to kind of interrogate your own experiences of gender and kind of place it along, okay, let me really think about this idea of gender identity and let me think about my gender expression and where do I feel, why do I feel pressure to present myself in certain ways? Um, I often talk about the fact that um, what we consider dressing up or what we consider professional dress is really just becoming more gendered, right? Um, dressing up means that you go out in a way that people then can recognize you easier in terms of gender. And so, and we don't always present ourselves in those ways. And so just thinking about our own experiences of gender um, allows us to see that this is not something that is um, outside of us. Gender is not outside of us. It's not something that other people have. It's something that we all really have an intimate relationship with. And I think if we see the depth in ourselves, then it'll be easier to also um, think about that in others, especially when we're writing about other other individuals as well. Yeah, and I think that for us, you know, we won't walk through each individual one because we've talked about them, but I think it's important to see like, um, and, and when we do this and have this conversation with people, they're always like, okay, so this is the map. So I just have to find myself right here. I have to just figure out where to put my dot, right? And so then we put our map up and it's like squiggle line, an H, uh, <laughs> uh, like, you know, in this, we cross words out, we put other things in because again- It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit even <laughs> as we're trying to do this, right? So there's still this desire to kind of create this like, uh, you know, it's like, I even as much as we resist or we try to find, you know, it's like there's this, this desire to, to keep pulling you back into this, like, I, I know I'm a square peg, but I really want to fit into that round hole. So if I could just figure out where to put myself. And so I think like the only real reason to kind of bring up our maps is to kind of see how differently and how we still do not feel like, um, this is going to capture everything for everyone, right? And so if we're really challenging it, we want to say that we understand, you know, in terms of like gender expression when Paz is saying like, you see that those two little lines, right? In, in this kind of gender expression idea, right? On this continuum going towards feminine, there's really a small area in which um, Paz really would want to be in there and that and it's understanding and that's kind of what we mentioned earlier is this idea is that when we say male and female even on these continuums there's a wide range of them and it, it would even be up to us to decide where we would put ourselves and what does this and even if you broke down any one of these lines right this this masculine um right what is this this, you know, it's kind of like a Likert scale, right? You got to find out what your point is and what your other point is so you can find out what these, what it actually means. And so when we talk about interrogating or really looking at it, it's like, you kind of have to name it and you have to put it out there in a way. And if it doesn't fit, you create squiggles, you write all, <laughs> you say humans, you put a line above the line, you put a dot above the line because you want to make sure that you know, and you do those things because again, because the language doesn't capture it uh -huh. and culture doesn't really capture what we're, and, and it's interesting because as writers, you're limited in some ways by language, right? You're limited in terms of thinking about that, but think about how much our language is gendered. Even when we're talking about, we think of it and, you know, early on in psychology, we talked about the opposite sex, 
right? We don't talk about that anymore. We might say other sexes, or we might not say um, the other sex will say all, you know, there's multiple genders and just shifting our language and there's in those more open ways allows for the imagination and the possibility of, of something else. But even using the language that we've been trained to use. And one of the things I, I do have kind of at the end that I really urge people to look at is the um, radical copy guide. Um, hey, let me see if you go all the way to the end. The radical copy editor's style guide to writing about trans people is really helpful because it'll kind of show you like, what is our traditional language? <laughs> and, and it's almost like a copy editor. It'll show sentences and then it'll cross out okay, why is that not a good thing to say? How else could I say it? Because sometimes it's really hard to imagine how do we alter our language to not be really binary in gender? And so for me, that's really helpful to be like, oh yeah, I would have said that because that's what we've been trained to say. And here's how it could be said differently um, that allows for more gender diversity. So for me, that's a really good um, resource in a particular way. So. And I think for, and I think that um, it's, there's also, you know, we, we prefaced it by saying there's a certain aspect of lived experience and you can take this off. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, unstop sharing now. I think. Um, but there's like lived experience and we know that it's not, everyone's, um, you know, might not have um, a, a close personal friendship, right? It might not have a person that they could, you know, bounce ideas off of, or who could um, read, you know, and 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 kind of work through and give feedback, you know. And so I think it is important um, how we, how those your, those social circles are created and formed, and who's who's reading and editing and working through pieces, and and who's in um and creating these like brainstorm circles, like how information is coming out there and, and who's talking about it. Cause I think for us, you know, when you're having, um, sometimes just by learning the language of what other people say, it's not enough, right? Cause we have to understand in what context or especially like I would say in like romance novels, right? Like if we are talking about what's body affirming to mm -hmm. a trans and non-binary person, it's going to be very different, right? And so that experience might not translate, right? It might not be the, and I, and I heard you talk about it in the beginning, right? This, this idea of like, what is our illusion? Are we reading a romance novel to find the ideal or to find something that's, that's magical or something that, you know, and, and so I think it is interesting when we start to write characters and say, how realistic does it need to be? And who, what, what story am I trying to tell, right? Cause I or think- who am I trying to tell it to? Right, and another. I think that, you know, cause I think that there's, um, we had a conversation with, um, with a friend who was, who was writing regarding um, someone who is socially transitioned. So someone who is binding, someone who is, um, when I say social transitions, it means like, you know, asking people to use a different name than maybe you were given at birth or things like that. Um, and so I think, you know, we start to get into to this idea of how um, people are respecting that character and how people are um, able to allow them to, um, to define themselves. But again, we we start to then we start to see somebody saying like, well, and this is their dead name, and this is their this, and and it's like, well, that's that's appropriate, but it's nobody would actually say refer to that that name as their dead name or like you know. So I mean, I think there's things that it's challenging because we're kind of saying all of these things. And I think we've been very careful not to say, don't do this and don't do that. Cause we want to do, right. We want to go, we want to, we want to create a time where we're not self-regulating to the point where we're afraid to do it. Right. And I think that, um, and so I, yeah, it's, it's going to be different, but I, I don't know how you expand your circles. And, and so maybe that would be more for the, the writers who write in, in this, way to kind of talk through, but I know that there's a fear of reinforcing stereotypes and there's a fear of, um, and, and it kind of leads people to just not do it. Yeah, I'm interested in just what this brings up 
in terms of if this, yeah, what does this bring up in terms of thinking about, you know, developing character or how much you feel um, you're already consciously kind of thinking through these things? Because it feels like I loved how much conversation we were having as we were kind of going through it. Um, so. And I, I, I want to just address what Karen said for a minute about how to expand your circle, because um, I know as somebody who grew up in a fairly um, closed circle of kind of, you know, white uh, evangelicalism, where things were all binary, for me, um, I had to come to a place where I, I, I started learning about other people. Um, out of a deep love for other people, um, as opposed to a self justification. And so, you know, we talk a lot about intention. And I would say that if, if you're expanding your circle, in order to elevate yourself or um, justify yourself, then self examine before you <laughs> before you bring other people into that mess um but if you're expanding your circle out of a deep love for other people and a desire to learn about other people um for your self evolution um that's a that's a good place to start right like i i know that's more on a philosophical level but for me it's translated into writing as well right like if i'm writing diversity in order to prove something about myself mm -hmm. or prove something about my work um maybe not right if i'm writing diversity in order to speak to people that uh, my work is safe and that they are safe to read my work and that i value and respect them as readers and who they are mm -hmm. then maybe explore right like for me that's the line i've drawn right like i'm not you know, uh, but that's me. I'd love to hear what uh, everyone else kind of has gone in this direction. I want to add to what you're saying, Jeff, because first of all, I love this idea that like we're expanding because of a love of people as opposed to like a need to fill a diversity box, mm -hmm. right? Like we all want to feel like we are not subscribing to white supremacist culture. So um, the immediate response to, well, I'm not a racist is because I have an ex friend, right? Like we, we've all heard that. And we, we want to move away from this idea that one person that we know who's diverse checks our diversity boxes. Um, uh, and for some of this, you know, Paz mentioned earlier that sometimes when you hear these things for the first time, it's like really emotionally charged. Um, and, you know, like this idea that I'm a good person. So it means all of these things. So like, there's some self reflection that needs to happen surrounding this but beyond that like as you start expanding your circles and as you start creating new friendships and new relationships please don't use that person as your only resource and you may have a ton of questions but don't ask all of your questions you know like there are things that like, if you don't want to answer questions about your own body parts, don't ask somebody else about theirs, right? Like, there are thousands of resources out there. You have Google. Like, if you want to have a relationship with somebody, be respectful of that person and their boundaries. And you may, at some point in your relationship, explore some of these things. But in the same way that Jeff is talking about, about, like, don't go out and get these relationships because of that like once you have them be respectful like people have feelings and like they shouldn't be tokenized so. yeah pe people are not here for your science experimentation questions right like people are people so treat people as people and if you have science experimentation questions like laura said you know there's plenty of ways for you to research without going to find people and making them into your um you know a token friend that's going to explain token things to you well i think it's 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 important that when you're asking a question is would you ask this question of a if you're asking it of b and that's a good place to start the other thing i think as laura was saying this it was reminding me um if you have a friend who identifies as whatever it is they're not necessarily represent representative of everyone 
who identifies as that. There is such complexity and diversity. I mean, I can I, I can think of friends that I have who would identify as as the same term that you would use in general, but they are so dramatically different from one another that a person A would not react that way, but person B would. And and I think I, I love that you showed the gender map. That was phenomenal. I can't wait to do one for myself because it'll help me understand there's a lot more complexity than I've ever really paid attention to uh, in terms of how I've identified in different contexts in different ways. But I think that's a great place to start uh, is looking at oneself and saying, wait a second, eh, it's not all as cut and dry as, I, <laughs> as I've been told. It's, I, I grew up in you know, Wonder Bread in Northern Ontario, small community where you know, there was no racial diversity. There, there was no other sexual identity other than that strict binary. Right. That was just not it didn't like very much like what Jeff talks about. So I'm uh, you know, I, I've spent a lot more of my adult life exploring and and listening and trying to understand that. But I have to remember just because I have one friend, like I have one friend who's a cop who behaves this way. It doesn't mean all cops behave that way. Right. Or, or one friend who's a surgeon who does one thing or the other. So it's 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 very it's, I think it's it, it's important for us when we are writing diverse characters to pay attention to the nuances between people in general. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. That's just something that I keep thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Mark, the, the, I was going to say, go for it. And the thing that, that's come up for, for me in my brain is it's extremely natural to have a very powerful sense of curiosity when you start exploring this. Um, and you just want to kind of, some people like me want to learn all the things. Um, and my journey probably started with Wikipedia and learning about all the cultural histories of different gender uh, definitions. Um, you don't need to start there, but one, uh, and JP and I talk about this um, in that episode that you guys referenced earlier, but um, one of the best ways to get to the point where you go from seeing someone as their gender identity and their sexuality because it is so other for you is to simply engage with media where you see many different people of many different uh, expressions and representations. YouTube is actually really amazing for this. And the more you see it, the more normal it becomes for you. Um, that way, when you do meet someone who is outside of your understanding of normativity, um, it is much easier to see them as the human they are rather than the new things you're not aware of. Very true. And I, and I think that, you know, we see that too, when, when people are, are transitioning and have, um, and have changed either, or, you know, their pronouns have, have evolved or they're, they're asking, or, um, you know, their name is, is different. You know, we often, say you talk about them when they're not with you right in your house say i wonder i wonder if karen would like this they don't usually like blue but i think they do right so you have to do things to yourself just like you're saying and practice it right because that's how you're not going to do it and be like and 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 say and use a pronoun that is not affirming right and so like it doesn't happen, it, just because it didn't happen automatically doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It means that there is, that, you know, there is a learning curve and how we're experiencing it and how we consistently do it and how we know how to um, acknowledge missteps and how we know how to have these conversations is such a key part of this because, um, relationships is, and really what people are writing about are so dynamic. You know, we can, you can have these, um, these very subtle things um, that are, that can be telling, right? And so when we, when we, we say it all the time, you know, it's like, it feels very, um, you know, I, I was talking to someone and they said, oh, that, that feels very weird. Just like, talk about someone in their in your house and you're just kind of like I wonder what I wonder if they would like this meal and it's like yeah but you're you're because you'd rather do it that way than have them you'd rather feel that it was a, a little um for your own self that it felt weird than what it would feel like in to misgender a person in front of their mm -hmm. face right and so you know we do there are 
tips and tricks, but I think, and everybody seems to have their own. I, I love hearing about them because I think it is the kind of social workarounds that we do and those strategies that really um, show investment and show like what we're doing. I because it, it yeah. normalizes that it doesn't just happen for everybody, right? I mean- it, and. And you will fuck up, like just yeah. accept you will fuck up. And that doesn't, and I hope I'm allowed to swear. And that doesn't make you a bad person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, just learning, right? Where we, we, yes, it's about curiosity and learning about other communities and learning about other experiences, but it's also about unlearning all those assumptions that we make. It's unlearning alignment, our expectations that are dictated out of alignment normativity and what we've kind of learned in such a pervasive way about the gender binary that, so it does take practice. It does, ca it does mean catching ourselves. I love Mark, when you were also talking about, you know, doing the map for yourself, because how can you understand where somebody else is positioned if you don't know where you're positioned? And that's where I was like really be trying to begin with this idea of positionality, because gender is such a social and interactional kind of exchange. And so you might think that you're trying to figure out where somebody else is, but how somebody else presents themselves and how they feel free to present themselves is dependent upon where you are. And if you don't know where you are and you're not conscious of that, then it's really hard for you to get a handle on somebody else because you don't understand the assumptions that you're coming from. And so there is a piece of, of like, do your own work, right? You gotta do your own work, not just about learning about other people, but about learning about yourself and your positionality and your intentions, I think as a writer. And, you know, I think about this as a researcher also, like there's a lot of different ways that you could approach doing research. Um, my way of doing it is, is by wanting to elevate the voices of people who aren't necessarily heard. Um, but for me to do that well, I have to know what my position is. I have to know what my intentions are. I have to know. And I think that that is um, something that's also important, even if you're writing fiction as well, is like, know who you are. Why would you write about gender otherwise? Mm -hmm. Like be conscious of your own gender and your own positionality. And then and then it'll be authentic because ultimately I think that's what we want. We want to write authentic stories. We want to elevate authentic stories. Um, so, yeah, I wanted I to add this, just going back to, to what we were saying about familiarizing yourself with other stories for the extroverts out there, because I tend to lean towards very introverted uh, research oriented uh, advice. If you're an extrovert who learns by speaking with people, Look for the people who are next to the the type of person you want to learn about, like someone you might have a relationship with already who is your friend, who is also friends with a transgender person, with an intersex person, and ask them if they would be comfortable helping you figure some stuff out. Um, they may not, and that's okay, but if you are the kind of person who needs to talk to someone, uh, the best people to go to to ask about these things are not always first the people that you're wondering about because they're already defending themselves all the time and explaining themselves all the time. But the people who are the connection between them and you are often really good people to talk to. I think as someone that's even part of the LGBTQIA community, otherwise known as the alphabet mafia, um, I think that I even have that hesitation to write these characters because I'm worried about the justice that I'll do for them but I'm part of that community. And so I'm taking more of this active step of just creating these realistic marginalized characters within my fiction because they need to have that voice. I want that voice in my fiction because I missed out on that when I was growing up and I don't want others to. Um, so I think it, it's fair for me to say that, yeah, you might screw it up too, but you know, we're all in this together and we all grow. And the only way we grow is through conversations like these and, you know, I took a look at Paz's, some of her articles, they're fantastic. I, I highly recommend that you look her up and you read her articles because they will just give you that voice of other people who've spoken. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, most of my articles are quotes of participants talking about their experiences. And, 
I mean, that's, that's why I do the research is to write those results sections where it's like, here's people who nobody really ever asks them these questions and allowing that to be kind of part. So even if you just read the results to hear like, I mean, when we're working on together kind of the simulation for writing for, for um, a simulation for therapists and working with trans and non-binary individuals. And, and so a lot of the research that we relied on was the research where we asked trans people, like, what were the, can I, you said I can cuss, right? What were the fucked up things that your therapists have said to you, right? And what were the good things that they've said to you? And then we use that with, and, and helped use that to create some of that dialogue that is authentic, that is real things that people have actually experienced. And so that, that lived experience, I think, is just is really invaluable. And I think it's interesting, too, and I'll kind of throw it up because I know uh, JP did put something in a chat. And so I think if people are listening, we, we won't hear it. But I think but we also spend a little time talk or won't, yeah, won't hear it. So if we spend a little time talking about um, this idea of because positive research is some is is there's some obviously discrimination, but there's also affirmations. And so we tend to cast characters in these very defined roles. And we also tend to, um, while it's a very lived and real experience, um, you know, we see stories that are characters that are um, their most ideal selves, but we're still churning out trans and nine binary characters who are uh, depressive and suicidal and and you know and so I think that when we start to play with this idea I wondered if people wanted to talk a little bit about that of of, of being of doing um the characters and the stories a real um and and an honesty to it right to 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 um that we owe the community if you will or I think being inside the community I feel that pressure um but in the same respect, to be real and to tell people what it's really like to live in the gray, to live in the margins of, of the world. But also, I don't want people to miss out on the real beauty I have in my life, right? The joy of it. Um, and so we, we want to talk, we want to see the de gender dysphoria, and we want to see the gender euphoria. And so we really want to kind of play that, that um, and talk about it. So I wasn't sure if people had anything that they wanted to say either about a, a character or a thought in their writer's story or what they've seen. Um, I, I think just because we we're mentioning about that comment. So I mentioned the, the movie that came out this year, last year, The Happiest Season, which is about a, a lesbian couple who goes home to meet one of the, the uh, person's parents. And in that, you know, they have this couple, uh, regardless of how it ended, which wasn't great. Um, they have these two other characters within the movie. They have the sassy gay friend who, whose partner doesn't exist. Uh, and then they also have the lesbian mentor whose partner is off screen. And they, they solely exist as these caricatures of the LGBT community. And it's almost as if the movie is pandering to the public by just reducing the actual romance on screen for LGBT characters to make it more palatable, which I, I just don't agree with that concept. I think, yes, you know, it's a, it's a good introduction, I guess, to the world, but I think that we're a little past that point and we really just need to create these characters who, you know, maybe they're a baker whose mother died and they're working on funeral um, plans and they happen to be a lesbian. It's not a story about the fact that they are a lesbian. It's just part of their being. I would say Discovery has probably some of my favorite, uh, Star Trek Discovery has some of my favorite representations, even though they did kill off one of their gay characters. Um, spoiler. Um, <laughs> they kind of fixed that. Spoiler. Um, and they also have a non-binary character. And these are, are things that matter to the characters because of who they are, but they don't matter to the story most of the time, other than the fact that you know these two characters in a relationship and that affects story plots. Um, and there's, I'm gonna misquote disclosure, but the idea that they said was this, um, the answer to problematic representations is simply more representation, then the problematic representation just has that much less weight. Mm 
Yeah, I think part of what we're talking about is kind of like, um, you know, for a long time, this was true of female characters with the Bechdel test in movies of like, does your female character exist just to talk about the men that are around them? Um, or does your character exist to actually express a, you know, like Karen said, the euphoria and joy of a specific lifestyle? Um, yeah, so just, and also just to say, we should probably say spoiler before we spoil it. <laughs> I know. That's <laughs> great. Just teasing. That just comes in the audio edit after where you pause and go, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Except I don't edit. I, I, you guys are better podcasters than I am. I don't edit anything. Uh, it just goes up how it is. Um, all right. Well, so I, I just want to pause. I feel like uh, we're kind of coming to a wrap. So I just want to stop for a second and say thank you to Paz and Karen um, for just leading us through this amazing discussion today. Uh, I think it was fantastic. And uh, you are both fantastic. And I appreciate um, you giving us your time and energy. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really great. Um, yeah. Anyone have any final thoughts before we uh, before we stop the recording? I mean, I think for us, we, we, I mean, just that it's a priority and a desire and people are seeking this information, right? I mean, it's like, I, and I, I loved the, the balance, right? It didn't feel invited in the sense that, of course, we had um, um, a, you know, a, a structure and a PowerPoint. I mean, who does that? But I mean, it, <laughs> in the sense that it was a real conversation yeah. because everybody had a perspective and it has been working through this in their own way and has been writing and evolving and thinking about this. I mean, I think when we both, we both got the, the list of who we were on today, you know, we, um, we, we internet stalked and, and had a great time <laughs> getting to know where everybody is and where they're coming from. And just like the diversity of what, of people in the room today, you know, it's really, um, it, it really speaks to a level of like, you know, I love, I, I, we loved catching your podcast and like hearing that this is um, this is out there and a priority in general, right? It's not just we should probably do this. This this would be a good topic for this podcast, right? It's that it's that people are looking for it and it's and it and that they're hungry for this information and it would be there's more and more representation, you know, with, if the resources and the links and things that you um, that you're trying to um, pass out are more readily available. And there's just so much more, you know, documentaries, you know, um, disclosure, we exist. You know, there's so many things out there now that are really going to give you this lived experience. And I love how we're talking about whether you're an introvert or you're an extrovert mm -hmm. or you're this or you're that and, and what you can do. Um, because oftentimes we're just say don't do this and don't do that and don't do this. And it's like, and you know, and yeah, that re that fear of, of um, stepping outside of yourself is, is really, and I'll say, honestly, I don't know. Jeff talks all the time about how my friendship impacted him. I, I mean, Jeff has opened my world to an idea that like, um, and I say this with a lot of love um, that not all Christians are scary. I mean, I, I've never, I, I will say that I grew up, you know, in a way in which that um, it wasn't, it, it wasn't comfortable or safe. And so Jeff had to put himself at a certain vulnerability um, at, to deal with my skepticism, right? And so like, and so that was work. And so it, it was work that was, um, I'm happy he feels so well worth it, but, um, but it was because you have to see where people are, are in order to meet them where they are. Um, and I, and I, so I'll have to give a shout out to Jeff for that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll end on this uh, little love fest by saying that putting, uh, putting any small risk that I took uh, was well worth it to know you. So, um, all right, on that note, I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, we can keep chatting, but we'll uh, end here. <laughs>